Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hey, this is Brie Noble, and I am so excited to be here with Monica Strutt. She is, I mean, she knows all what, that you need to know about social media for musicians. She has the Being in a Band podcast, and I can't wait to dig into all of this stuff with her. We're going to talk about work-life balance and, you know, everything that we need to know as musicians to feel good about what we're doing and feel like we're being able to make the kind of impact we want without getting totally burnt out. So before we get into that, I'd love to have her share just some of her backstory. So we know, you know, how did you get into music and how did you end up doing what you do today? Well, hello, thank you for having me. So I am a musician first and foremost. I've been playing in bands and doing music since I was very, very young and performing since I was very, very young. Uh, I initially wanted to be an actress though, but when I went into high school, I didn't get into the school's musical because I couldn't sing. And I'd already been writing lyrics, which is all little poems and whatnot. And uh, performing and kind of learning to sing was that missing piece. So I ended up taking up singing lessons and falling in love with being a vocalist and it allowed me to kind of bring my songs to life. And I fell in love with uh, rock music. That was my first kind of uh, my first love and it's what made me want to actually do music full time. Uh, so there was nothing else I wanted to study outside of uh, high school. So then I studied uh, contemporary music performance at uh, university. But when I left uni, uh, I noticed that it, the course didn't really teach me a lot about how the current music business actually worked. So there was this huge gap in knowledge. A lot of what they were teaching in terms of marketing was very, very old school. They weren't really bridging the gap about how that kind of knowledge was to be applied uh, in the real world, in real world scenarios and, you know, networking and all these things that make the music industry what it is, especially social media. We learned nothing about social media, despite the fact that MySpace was one of the biggest platforms for musicians at the time. So I was in a band for six years uh, and trying to teach myself all the real world stuff. Uh, and then that band broke up. This is a very quick <laughs> backstory. And, you know, we had built that band basically from being completely unknown in the scene to touring overseas, touring nationally. We're getting really good supports. We're getting label and management interest. But when that band broke up, I thought, oh my gosh, I can't spend another six years taking a band essentially to the beginning of its career. I have to find some kind of a shortcut. And that's when I pivoted my day job to marketing. And I started, um, I was already working at, casually as a music journalist, but I took up the, as the role as a social media manager for a um, big music publication here in Australia. And I started as a result of that mixing with labels and managers and really getting exposure that I'd never had before to the business side of music. And I thought, okay, I've been trying to teach myself this for a really long time, but I feel like no one's really sharing this knowledge. You wouldn't really get this knowledge unless you were working in the industry. So that's when I decided to start my consulting business, which led into a blog and a podcast and courses, membership, that sort of thing. And my goal is really to teach a band to fish. I don't want to be a manager or anything. I want to empower musicians and bands, especially. Um, I work with all genres, but largely within like the rock metal, heavier alternative genres uh, to really treat their band as a business and empower them so that uh, they can, I guess, make money doing what they love and um, hopefully prevent any like, 
seedy industry people <laughs> screwing them over and uh, I guess like just help them live their most fulfilled lives. Oh, I love that. And, and I, you know, there are people out there doing what you're doing. I love that you're focusing on bands and especially in the rock genre, because I think number one is I, I've been in bands and it's, it's hard, right? I mean, there's more than one person trying to steer the ship. So I love that you have been in a band, you know what those difficulties are and how to guide them through that. And that it's in the rock genre, because I think a lot of times, you know, I, I work with a lot of people that are in like folk, you know, duos, or um, maybe even just a, uh, even a classical group I've worked with, you know, but not as much in the rock genre, because for whatever reason, they don't seem to be reaching out for those resources. So I'm glad that you're, um, you know, kind of filling that void. Do you, do you feel like they're hungry for that stuff, but they don't know where to find it? I think so. I think the main problem is in terms of learning about the industry, and this was the problem for me for many years, uh, I do have a bookcase behind me of like biographies of like Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue and like all, you know, ACDC and all those 80s rock bands. And they started, you know, publishing these bios when I was, you know, a teenager and, and just getting into, you know, rock and metal. And a lot of the the musicians in this genre are, are all the resources that they've gone off are from the 80s and they're not how the music industry actually works right now so there's a real um there's a real different culture in the rock and metal scene um in terms of they're very focused on they do want to play live and they do want to tour and achieve these certain milestones and it is harder being in a group as well as you said with multiple people steering the ship so uh, yeah, it's about kind of not playing too often is one of the biggest things because, um, you know, a, a lot of the, the old school way of, of getting traction as a band is to play as many shows. Whereas, I mean, particularly in Australia, our market isn't big. So it's about kind of dispelling those old practices and getting more online and current and how to market yourself as a business. Yeah. Yeah. And that is a good point that you guys have a smaller market and you can like way oversaturate it by just playing too much, um, mm. which maybe seems counterintuitive, but I totally get that because if people just think that they can access you whenever they want, they're not, there's not gonna be that urgency for them to come out and see you. Absolutely. Yeah. There's supply and demand. So totally. Yeah. So I, I wanted to bring up something in your story about music school and how it doesn't prepare you. And I talk about this a lot too. I felt like we didn't even get any marketing. You know, I was more like a classically trained vocalist. So we didn't get any marketing training at all. Um, I was coming up in the nineties and it just wasn't discussed. Like their whole job was to make you a great musician, which they did. They did a great job with that, but that was it. And so like you, you know, you leave school and you're just completely out there on your own going now what? Like, I don't have anyone to tell me to go practice. I don't have anyone to tell me, you know, that I, you have a jury that you're preparing for in three months or a recital and you better get ready for it. Like you're just out there going like, well, what do I do? Like, I have no idea what I'm preparing for or who I'm preparing for or how I would even have anyone hear me sing, you know? And so I was completely lost for a long time. And I think it's really interesting that you said that when you were at school, they were teaching marketing, which makes me happy. At least they were trying, but yet, you know, they weren't even talking about social media when MySpace was huge and MySpace was breaking artists, right? Why do you think, do you think that the people in university just aren't keeping up and they're just sticking with what they already know? Yeah. I mean, the three years that I spent at university were some of the best three years of my life I was really coming into myself and the friends that I met are my, still my best friends today so I can never regret going I'm it was still absolutely meant to be in the right choice for me but I chose that particular course because of the fact that it was partly business focused there were courses that I could have done which were uh, straight performance courses um, just focused on my instruments which were that time a bass and vocals but I chose this one because I wanted to learn about copyright law. I wanted to learn about 
audio production and, and, you know, there was various subjects, which, which I thought it was quite well rounded. But I think the problem with more traditional avenues of education is everything has to go through a board and has to be approved by the government. And that process can take a really long time. And the people that are teaching it, you know, although it's often advertised as, you know, these people are still like working in the industry and they usually are still in some capacity, but they've already kind of had their career. They're not at the beginning of their career. So I think it's a combination of, I mean, the people teaching may not necessarily be as uh, kind of ingrained in how the music industry is and trying to, you know, start a career. Um, and also the fact that I think to get approval for those sort of courses, it's a really long process. And by the time like a curriculum gets approved, I think uh, the music industry just moves so fast that it's already outdated information. Yeah. I mean, that's actually one thing that's been really good about this COVID time period. Like I've been able to come in and teach lectures at universities that I normally would never be able to because there's a whole rigmarole to get in right but I've had friends that work at universities our professors and invited me because we could do it virtual and it's oh, yeah. just not as hard for some reason for them to get approval for that because they're just kind of flying by the seat of their pants on how they can get you know get the information that they want to the students that it would it just opened up some stuff which I think is great mm. Yeah, absolutely. Like that's, that's really cool. And we would occasionally get guest speakers, people that were full-time session musicians. And I remember one lecture by a, a, a Australian guitarist called Peter Northcutt, and he was just so inspirational. So from time to time we would have guest speakers and I always did actually find that those were the most relevant and inspiring yeah because they were in it. They were brought in because of what they were doing at that current moment. So, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So when, when you leave school and you're a musician, usually you have to get a day job, right? At first, maybe you're pursuing a band on the side, um, but you do have to have that job to pay the bills and everything. Did you experience that when you were in your band and what recommendations do you have for people that do have to have a day job, how they can still do the band thing? Yeah, so I did get a day job pretty much straight out of uni within a creative industry. Uh, and I mean, I, I chose that particular, I, I, went with it. I went for that particular role because it was in copyright and royalties and not for the music industry, but for the publishing industry and visual arts. So I thought I was going to leave university, go into this like creative job in this creative environment. It ended up being the exact opposite of that. So uh, it ended up being quite corporate. Uh, I mean, not in the sense that we had to wear suits every day or anything, but certainly there was a dress code. Uh, there was a lot of political things within the organization. It was quite large and the offices were very drab. So as a creative person going from you know, college where every single day was, you know, you were being inspired and encouraged to practice your instrument and have rehearsals and learning about the music industry. I mean, how hard is that? Uh, into this environment where, I mean, it was cool to start earning an income and going from a student to that. And I was definitely grateful for the job. But after a couple of years, I uh, I think it's one of the hardest things is that disconnect between being a creative person and then all of a sudden being forced to act and dress like something that you don't feel like you are <laughs> inside. And eventually, uh, you know, that really, really kind of like wore away at uh, my like mental health and everything. So finding that balance um, is definitely something that I love to speak about. And there's a few things that you can do. I mean, first off, like I was in that job for nearly six years. I don't know how I ended up in that job for so long. I think I was comfortable and I was actually looking for another job and, you know, just it, 
my manager was quite good. So whenever I did have to tour or take time off to record, she actually was a great manager and allowed me that. So um, it's kind of like one of those better the devil, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) sort of situations. Um, But one of the things that I recommend is if you are in that position, if you resonate with that disconnect between being a creative and being stuck in a job that is just soul sucking and maybe it's starting to impact your mental health because you just don't care about the job and feel like it is preventing you from pursuing your your creative pursuits, then I would suggest if you're working full-time, drop down to part-time immediately, if not sooner. I was working five days a week and due to the fact that, I mean, a lot of people traditionally don't view music as a proper career choice. So there was kind of a little bit of a stigma of, I had to get a job that was five days a week because you know, if I didn't, then I was lazy, but you have to remember that if you're a musician, you are, you already have a full-time job and trying to build that on the side. So give yourself a little bit of leeway. If you can drop from five days to four days, ask ask your workplace, um, then yeah, I would highly, highly recommend. Um, The other thing is I would use my net time to and from work to Uh, work on my music business. So usually that would be stuff like social media posting or, I mean, I was also at a job that allowed me access to a computer and the internet. And uh, I would be often able to, in my downtime, book tours, coordinate artwork for releases while I was actually at work because uh, it wasn't a crazy busy role, to be honest. Some days were, you know, full and other days I would would do all my work in two hours and be sitting there twiddling my Mm. thumbs. So I was blessed that I had a job that allowed me like freedom and flexibility. And, um, and that was another reason I think why I stayed, stayed that long. But for those of you who maybe aren't allowed a phone (laughs) at your desk or anything, it's like the, the time to and from work, your lunch breaks, I would often go sit in a park and be listening to demos that my guitarist or band would send me and formulating lyrics and taking advantage of any spare amount of time that I had to fill it with pursuing my music career because if I didn't do that then I kind of felt like I was working for nothing um so drop down if, it, if your job is really starting to wear away your mental health like it was for me um but also take advantage of that net time to and from work to feel like you're not just working building someone else's dream you are actually spending your days every day working inching closer towards your goals as well yeah. I mean, that's why I think podcasts are so great. I, I have talked a lot about how can you fit music into a super busy schedule, especially if you're working. And one of those ways is that you can listen to podcasts mm-hmm. or maybe a course that you invested in, that's going to help you learn a certain skill. And you can do that to and from, especially if you're, you know, if you're doing, if you're on like a public transportation or something, that's awesome. Cause then you don't even have to be looking at the road. But if you are having to drive, then you can listen to podcasts. And that's why I think, you know, podcasts like yours are super helpful because they can learn and take in information just in that dead time. Yeah, exactly. And when I moved to a different city where, I, where I'm in now, um, I actually drove to and from all the jobs that I've had here. So that was a nice break, actually going from public transport to being in my car. Um, but of course, I couldn't be posting on social media. So <laughs> then it was podcasts, audiobooks, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, just like getting in that knowledge and feeling like you've already achieved something towards your music goals first thing in the morning before you've even gotten to work is uh, it can, it really does help. Yeah. It can put you in that mindset of like, yeah, I am a musician and I am doing something every day toward my goals as a musician and not just this job. Mm. So I know that social media can be a big sticking point because there is a lot we have to do with social media to keep that up. So I know you have some really good tips on how to kind of build up content. So you're not having to stress every day about what to put on social media. And I'd also love to know, like, do you help, do you recommend bands like break it up in a certain way? So, you know, one person handles this part of social media, one person handles this part. Yeah, I think generally it's easier if one person does manage social media channels. I used to advocate for one person managing, say, Facebook and Instagram, one person managing like Twitter and YouTube or something. 
But um, I think once you get in the hang of social media, you're largely posting the same content just in slightly different formats across the platforms anyway. It is a lot easier. So the way that I'm currently doing it in my own band, because um, I'm in it with all of my clients, like building my own band up. Um, so, you know, I genuinely, the stuff that I recommend is like stuff that I'm doing and trying. Um, and I can, I am able to experiment a little bit, <laughs> which is kind of nice. Um, the way that we're doing it is now I just managed, manage social media. Um, the boys, usually my drummer will also pitch in, in terms of like community management. So if he notices that I haven't replied to a comment on like YouTube, where comments can kind of uh, go under the radar a little bit. Uh, and also, um, you know, people that follow us, he always sends them a message. Thanks for following us. And we found that that's just a really nice way of like, it takes two seconds um, to like personalize it. Uh, so he, he manages kind of that sort of side of community management. And also my drummer and bass player are also like photographers and, and enjoy video editing. So how we're going to approach this next phase as uh, we're going into like a relaunch um, after 2020 was a bit of a write-off. Um, so how we're approaching that is I've kind of done like a bit of a content plan. It's very loose. I'm very relaxed. I like to keep things as stress-free as possible. I'm not like on this day, you must post this on this day, you must post this sometimes, but not, not for every single thing they're creating the content. So if we need a graphic, they'll create it, put it in a folder for me. Um, we've already got like a bank of photos sitting there in a folder. And then I can just draw from that whenever I'm scheduling stuff out. Um, so that takes the stress off me of like, I think the problem is uh, why people don't post on social media. So like, Oh, I don't know what to post. But if you have that bank of content ready, you know, what's coming up, you've got graphics prepared, you've got behind the scenes photos from like videos, stuff like that in a folder, then the person that's scheduling can, it just makes their life so much easier. So the more that you can, um, I guess, document things. That's a really good way of getting content. And also actually the thing that is most effective is making sure that all your releases are planned out for the next six to 12 months. Things will always change, but at least you know that, uh, you know, you're planning forward so that you've always got something to promote basically, whether it's a show, whether it's a release, whether it's a new merch drop, if you plan all of that out, then your socials aren't going to go dead because there's always something happening. So I think like the actual business planning of your band plays so much into social media uh, and being active continuously because, um, yeah, if, if you're not sure what's coming up next month and you're just kind of uh, making it up as you go, then you're going to get stuck posting on socials as well. Yeah, that's a good point that like the socials being difficult are just more like a byproduct of not having a good plan for your band and knowing exactly what's happening throughout the year. I know for me, like in my business, you know, I would love to have planned everything out from the beginning of the year to the end. And I have like, you know, a loose thing and that's obviously going to change, but it feels good to know that like, this is the skeleton of the year, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's a little bit different if you're, you know, a podcaster and, you know, you own a business like we do, because we know that we've got a new podcast episode or video coming out every single week. So we always have content to post about. Um, and that's kind of like our pillars of like what we're regularly posting. But if you're a musician or a band, you don't have a new song coming out every single week. That's virtually impossible as much as Spotify would like to say. Make sure that you're releasing <laughs> like a million singles a year. It's just oh especially... God you know, for if you're in an, if you're in a band and you need to, you know, record real drums, you know, that's expensive to go to a studio and set that all up. It's a day just to set up and pack down. Um, it's just not possible. So um, yeah, there's, the, it, it's a little bit harder in that sense, but um, yeah, that's where the planning I think comes into it. Yeah, definitely. So um what was I, I was, I had something in mind that I was going to ask you and now it just completely fell out of my brain. Um, but so is there a way to like, actually, I love the idea of them doing the graphics for you. So you feel like you're not having to create all of it right when you go into that. So I, I really like that delegation aspect of 
And do you recommend with bands that you kind of sit down and like, okay, these are the things I like to do. These are my strengths and try to delegate in that way. Yeah, absolutely. So for example, my guitarist, he's, he's not so much into social media. He doesn't enjoy it as much as the rest of us. And that is totally fine. He still has a social media public account, like he's, he's, Instagram he's actually created a new Instagram for the band but he's just not into it as much as we are and I think that most groups can kind of there's always going to be one person that's not as wanting to get so much involved in like the digital side of things and that's totally that's okay so but he does he does most of the songwriting he does all of our tech setup on stage we have Mm -hmm. like a digital setup and we play the backing tracks um, and everything um he is usually the one like coordinating the shows and going back and forth with venues and other bands about backline that sort of thing so he does he always is the one booking rehearsals like he does a lot in the band that's not like public facing so Mm -hmm. um you know when last week we were reviewing our um content plan and pr and everything like that for the next few months and i was like I I usually put task owners, I've got this like spreadsheet system and there's always a a task owner assigned to every task. So everyone knows what each other's doing. I think that that's like key. And I was like, Ben, your name's not anywhere on these tasks because you do enough, like you are taking care of all this and we can feel confident in that. And we trust you with that. So you don't even worry. Like you're just in this meeting just so you know what's happening, but like, you don't have to do any of this. Um, my drummer is like very analytical minded he's an engineer in his day job and uh he's also very interested in social media so even though i'm the one that works professionally in marketing uh he's very interested and very very cluey with that sort of stuff so i would love to get him involved in like the facebook ads and he will be involved in like the facebook ads side of things and he was like yeah like i'm super keen which is great for me because i'm more of like a bird's eye view i like to look at like a whole plan i'm I'm more creative branding that sort of thing facebook ads analytics that's not so much what i enjoy so i'm Mm. like perfect he can take care of that um and you know my bass player is like extremely visual he like literally dressed us all for like our video clip because he just has like (laughs) such a creative eye for fashion and everything. So finding everyone's strengths. And it took us a while to find that as well. I mean, we've been working together for three years, um, you know, behind the scenes. And then we launched in 2018. So it takes a while to figure out everyone's strengths. And then we had a lineup change and that's always hard when someone new comes in. Um, But the most important thing, I guess, that, uh, you know, anyone watching or listening can take away is that everyone must play a part in the business if you're a group, the business of being in your band. Uh, Because if one person's just turning up and playing their instrument, going to rehearsals and going home and not involved in the business side of things, especially if they're not contributing financially, then it means they're not invested figuratively Mm -hmm. and literally. So the most important thing is that everyone has a task and sometimes you know tasks are going to overlap and multiple people will be involved in a similar in the same thing but it's important that everyone in your group even if it's just a duo takes ownership over one element of running the business because uh it's not going to work if it falls on one person's shoulders they're going to get burned out i've been there before and also it's just more productive imagine having you know four or five times the uh you know, the energy like going into making your career a success as opposed to just, you know, one person doing it, you're going to move a lot faster and it's going to be a lot fairer. Yeah. I mean, you have a built-in team, right? You know, I've had to build up my team and hire my team over time, but you have a built-in team when you have a band. So if everybody Mm -hmm. is contributing, that is awesome. Yeah. Take advantage of that. (laughs) But so many people don't that like, you know, half the time when I work with bands, I just work with one person, Mm -hmm. either they are the whole band and they're more presenting like a band and they have a band name, but they're really just a solo artist or they are in a band, but they're kind of like the main admin person. And I always encourage, you know, I'd really love your bandmates to be involved and be here. And um, a lot of the time then they come in, but sometimes it is just one person shouldering the load and that's why they hire someone like me to help them guide them and just to have a bit of that uh brain power shared with someone else so um yeah like there's still a lot of people that don't take advantage of that 
Yeah, for sure. It's really good to have someone to bounce ideas off of. So if your band is not doing that, someone like you is definitely very helpful. Um, I did, I know what I wanted to ask you was about 2020. How, how did you guys navigate 2020 as a band? Did you start doing live streams? Um, you know, I know Australia, like not everything totally shut down. So I had some students over there that were still doing like low capacity venues and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So unfortunately where my band is based, um, where I'm based in Melbourne, we were the worst hit with COVID. So we actually went into a lockdown uh, for about three months. We went into a couple of different versions of the lockdown, but the um, stage four lockdown was between it was, a, it was between August and early November or end of October, I think. Um, yeah, so in August, September, October. And that was when we could not leave the house. We could only go five kilometers, which I'm not sure how many miles that is, but that's basically like a suburb um, kind of radius. Um, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not far and we could only leave to groceries and everything, but the rules were always changing all through 2020. So in between the gaps, when things loosened up, maybe we were only allowed like one person within a certain indoor radius. Then one of us would be able to go to the recording studio, do our parts. And then the next day we would kind of like swap and then I would go in um, and do my parts. So for 2020, I mean, our plans completely changed. We had a single ready to go that we recorded in December, 2019, which was leading off the back of another single that we were doing and we were going to launch in March, but then with COVID, our video clip got canceled the basically the week before. Oh. Um, yeah. So that video clip, we actually filmed two weeks ago, finally, after it got rescheduled five times, Wow, <laughs> which was pretty demoralizing and almost um, an entire year later. <laughs> oh yeah. Like exactly. So, um, but I mean, I think it allowed a lot of people to take a step back pivot. And whilst our strategy was going to be releasing singles, we decided to do a second EP and I'm so glad. And although we kind of, we were, we really had to scrape the bottom of the barrel to like think of things to post on socials. We didn't go down the live stream route just because of the nature of, uh, you know, just being, I guess, a metal band. So that's like harder to, um, and we physically weren't really allowed to be in the same room as well. Right. So any live streams that we would have done, I mean, I don't have the proper equipment in my house, even though my, you know, guitarist and drummer do. Um, so it just, w it, like, it just wasn't really an option for us, unfortunately. But I know a lot of people um, went down that road, road or did acoustic versions. For us, like, we just chose to kind of, fingers crossed and <laughs> keeping to post on social media as much as we could. We had filmed some content prior to the like COVID hitting, which we were able to put out like behind the scenes interviews and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, we recorded that second EP, but I'm very, very excited. My poor bass player, he's been in the band since the end of 2019 and he's only just been announced because we only just got new, <laughs> were able to get new photos like with him in them. So like all the social media stuff that we we're posting, like he's not in any of the photos because he is like new to the band and yeah. So uh, he's very happy that we are rebranding and he's finally publicly allowed to like be in the band now. Um, but yeah, it's just like pivoting, but yeah, it was hard. Like, because, you know, we're not getting any younger and, the feeling that our career was being stalled, even though we were able to record, but you know, we already had two of those songs recorded by the end of 2019. So we really only recorded three new songs to complete this EP in last year. Um, I personally struggled with, um, I guess, just feeling like very stalled and feeling like, like, oh, like I was watching other bands who just happen to be more prepared and have releases prepared, like getting out there and, and everything and f like feeling like uh yeah like feeling yeah just that my career was stalled and just it was just really really frustrating so I had to overcome like a fear of getting older I had to overcome mm. like uh you know everything happens in like divine timing um like I had to like keep telling myself that and like you know things will happen for us when they're meant to and I'm really glad that I was able to face some of those things, some of those fears that I'd probably been pushing down for years 
And I think COVID allowed uh, everyone around the world to kind of like go within literally like within our homes and really spend time with ourselves. And hopefully um, it's been a positive thing uh, in some, in some ways, as hard as it's been. So. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I know what you mean. And, and, you know, with the, I know for me, like I didn't even start my music career really until I was 30. And so I always felt that pressure of like, mm-hmm. you're getting older, you're getting older. Now you have kids, how are you going to do this? You know, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I can imagine so many people in 2020 just felt like I am losing an entire year of my career and I'm not getting younger. And, you know, that's very, very frustrating. So, but it sounds like you were at least able to be creative during that time and create something. And now you're like ready to, to go as things are opening up. Oh yeah. I'm like a bull at a gate right now. I was <laughs> talking to a friend about this the other day and I'm like, I've just got so much energy. Like, I feel like, I feel like, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've got my toes on the line of the football field and I've been, uh, I've been benched and I've got the uniform. I've been doing the training, like my head's in the game. I've been watching the game. Like I know everything that's happening. I've been like, yeah training my butt off and I'm like I just need someone to like grab me and like pull me onto the football field right now because I'm like ready to go um (laughs) so yeah that's how I feel that's awesome like yeah that just makes me want to get hear your music because like I am so ready to hear someone that's got that kind of a an attitude and excitement about their music so um I would I know people that listening to this would like to find out about your band as well as about your podcast and what you do. So if you could give them all the important links. Yeah, absolutely. So my band is called The Last Martyr. We're rock metal. Um, very like the new stuff is very, um, it's a little bit more mainstream. So it's very, very um, melodic, which is like, I love a good big chorus. So if you like stuff that's like a little bit heavier, but it's still got the melody and it's still like catchy, you can sing along to then you'll probably like it. Uh, Mostly follow us on Instagram and Twitter because right now uh, Facebook is being weird with uh, Australian news pages and uh, (laughs) everything like that, which is a whole nother story. Uh, But my podcast is called Being in a Band. Um, It has uh, episodes on things like branding and marketing and mindset as well, which is like very, very important to me. And I also have a weekly segment on the Daily Music Business podcast. Uh, so usually I, I think my episode comes out like every Wednesday or Thursday, but they put out short, easy to digest episodes daily. So yeah, check it out. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been really great. And I, I don't talk to a lot of people that are actually in bands, which it made me realize when I saw your podcast, I'm like, I'm not serving this market. So I'm glad that we (laughs) talked about that. I, most of us have been in a band, at least at one time, I certainly have been in multiple ones. Um, and it's, it's, it's not easy, but when it works, it's amazing. At least my experience is right. As hard as it can be trying to run something by four other different people. Um, I love the camaraderie of being in a band and that feeling of creating something with other people. I think that that just makes up (laughs) for all of that. So, yeah. Yep. Yep. It totally does. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate you sharing everything that you did with us today. Thanks, Bree. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.